Today, we are going to be talking about real estate. We're going to be talking about 10 rules of successful real estate investing. And I've got uh, I've got someone here today that uh, that knows a lot about real estate investing. I know you guys have heard about my my investing and some of the investments I've done, but I don't work with this every single day in and out. You know, I, I manage my properties. I do some purchases here and there and, you know, and I, I collect the, the rent. But I've got Marco Santorelli here and he is actually uh, you know, runs a company that is is really a uh, involved in in sourcing properties that you can buy kind of wholesaling and really giving you turnkey solutions to uh, to real estate investment so he's in there you know day in and day in out working with real estate and so that would be a perfect guest to invite to, you know to talk about this topic of of the rules that you need to be successful in real estate investing so welcome Marco John it's awesome to be here I'm very excited to talk to you and share some great knowledge with your uh, audience but uh, how you been I've been crazy busy and living the dream all at the same time. <laughs> how, about, how about yourself? Uh, about the same. Yeah, been been crazy busy and uh, actually just closed on a, a big commercial real estate uh, investment just about uh, a couple weeks ago where I, I did a 1031 exchange and I exchanged six properties into one and bought this commercial property cash. So that was taking up nice. a lot of a lot of uh it was a big headache i mean trying to get six I was, I was trying to get as many properties as i could into the 1031 and i was like okay i'm just going to go for it see if i can get all six of these sold and and flipped over in the, in the 180 day time frame and i and i made it with like a few days to spare so <laughs> that's the stressful thing about doing a, a tax deferred exchange like that is you're under the gun all the time because you have to meet those deadlines and there's absolutely no exception the irs doesn't give you any leeway no, no, so. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was so nervous. I'm like, I hope I fill the forms out right. I hope everything is like, you know, because if someone else screws up in the, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you screw up or someone else screws up, uh, you're, you're in trouble, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. So it could be a lot of money for capital gain tax. I know you live in California as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Well, good. Congratulations. Awesome. So before we jump into the the 10 successful rules for real estate investing, maybe just uh, if you want to give kind of a quick background, what's what's your background? You know, how did you get started? What do you, what do you do in the in the real estate industry? Yeah. So to make a, a long story short, I, uh, you know, I recognized at an early age that people created wealth and, and became financially independent in real estate. In fact, I recognized that as, a, as an early teen, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't make my move until I turned 18 because I couldn't couldn't qualify for financing until I was 18. But that's when I bought my first rental property. And, you know, the writing was on the wall, as they say. Uh, I've been a serial entrepreneur and I've had my fair share of failures and successes over the years uh, from that point. But ultimately in 2003, I kind of came full circle and to the realization that what I love the most is real estate and I wanted to invest and be involved in real estate full time. So I became a full time real estate investor buying 84 doors in a nine month period uh, in 2004 and uh, had investors coming to me saying, hey, can you coach me, help me, mentor me, whatever the co uh, case was. I didn't want to do that. I, I, I like to help and I freely did, but I didn't want that to be my business. I wanted to stay focused. But ultimately, what I did do is what people wanted at the end of the day, and that is good, good quality investment properties. So I had enough deal flow that I didn't buy everything myself. I was able to essentially give away a lot of those properties, but ultimately, I turned that into a business. So I started in 2004, and we're still doing the same thing today, and that is really we're a nationwide provider of these turnkey cash flowing rental properties in 22 different markets in the U.S., markets that actually make sense, not unlike coastal California where you and I live. And, um, and, uh, and you know, that's, that's what I love to do, and we love to help people and freely educate them and, and freely guide them into investing and building their portfolio to create passive income and financial freedom for themselves. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's uh, we have very similar, similar backgrounds. I, I also started I, I bought my first house when I was 19. And uh, I just I didn't know I didn't really know about real estate investing, but I, I just didn't I knew I didn't want to pay rent. And uh, it was hard to obtain, obtain financing at, the, at that age. I'll tell you, I got I got a, I think I got a 13 percent interest rate with like a three year prepayment penalty in there. It was it was like one of those really, uh, really nasty loans. But uh, but I'm glad I did. So yeah. nice. Good for you. Congratulations. Yeah, it's good to start at an early age. And, you know, I, I you know, as I understand, your audience is mostly in their 20s and 30s. I mean, you've got time on your side. If you don't take advantage of this time right now, 
and 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 let that compound for you and grow you are really wasting a lot of time energy and opportunity and we refer to that as an opportunity cost by not actually getting involved and and taking action today you know you're going to look back and maybe regret the lost time that you've had so take advantage of your young age and do something yeah absolutely i agree 100 percent. the i always tell people that the compounding always comes off of the back end right because the most valuable year with compounded interest is is the last year and so if you think about it like if you if you wait one more year to start you lose that last year the most valuable year is what you're losing not the not the you know so so that's yeah you're absolutely right like everyone should be and and, right. and here's the other thing let me get your opinion on this because i've been telling people this all the time and you know i know we want to make good deals as real estate investors but it'd be it'd be good to hear have someone else's chime in on this but i always tell you know a lot of my coaching clients and stuff i tell them like look i want you to get a good deal i'm going to teach you how to get the best deal that you can but I'd rather see you buy a deal where you even paid over market price, just slightly over market price and buy it now. Right. And, uh, and, and actually get into a real estate investment than to just hmm and ha and just try to find that perfect deal and wait like two years, because in 20 years, if you're look, if you're investing for the long term, you're not going to care if you paid 10 K more than you should have for the property. You're going to be glad you bought it. I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And uh, the only caveat to what you said is how are we defining that investment? Because for some people, I, I'm going to call it investments with air quotes, mm -hmm. uh, refer to something that is speculative in nature uh, and really more of a gamble than right. true investment. And so as long as you, we all have the same definition of what a real estate investment is or an investment in any kind of investment, then yes, you're 100 percent correct. And I do agree with you. Okay, because my talking about that as part of these rules, what you know, yeah. what true investment is. Okay, yeah, because my my definition of an investment, the one that I always use, is I say an investment makes sense now. You don't need any future events to happen in order for you to turn a profit or for it to be, uh, for it to to give you a return. Whereas a speculation, it you're depending on some kind of. If you depend on any kind of future event, it's a speculation. That's exactly right. Okay. It, it, yeah, it has to make sense today and it has to generate an in, uh, income and a return for you today. It cannot be contingent, contingent upon a future event happening, which may not happen. That's just a hope. That's not a plan or even, you know, a true uh, a, a, a surety. So, yes, I agree with you. Perfect. We're going to get along very well. <laughs> <laughs> I argue with cool. people about this all the time, especially the Bitcoin stuff, right? All these people are like, oh, I'm investing in Bitcoin. I'm like, you can't invest in Bitcoin. It's not possible. You can speculate in Bitcoin if you want, but you can't invest in it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And all you're doing is just getting greater clarity on what people are talking about in terms of investing. And you're absolutely right. I have I have all kinds of crypto but I don't call any of it an investment. I call it a speculation and what it could become. Exactly. And I don't know if that's ever going to materialize. It could all go to zero. All so right, I exactly. don't know. Yeah. Right. Perfect. All right. So let's uh, let's jump into it. Let's get through these these uh, get into the ten rules of successful real estate investing. What's the the first rule you got for me? So you know it's it's important to understand that these came about through years of just successes and failures. So mm -hmm. really, I don't want you and your audience to step on the same landmines and make similar mistakes that that me and many other people that I know have in the past. And so the, you know this this kind of forms the core philosophy and methodology that we use in our business here at Norada Real Estate. So I pass this on freely all the time because these are kind of the cornerstone. If you follow these things, you probably assured uh, your success by about a factor of 90%. Mm -hmm. And you can't control that last 10% because it's the human element and not every human is is predictable. And, you know, people sometimes go sideways or lose their jobs or whatever happens, right? But the first thing is really to educate yourself. That's my number one rule. Why? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you should be investing in yourself first. It's great to be an investor and, and invest, but if you don't invest in yourself, then um, then you're kind of falling short. So knowledge is what I refer to as the new currency. And you, you have to have it because if you don't, you're going to follow other people's advice, not knowing if it's bad or good advice. Mm -hmm. So don't ride on other people's coattails. You need to take control of things. And you do that by educating yourself. And you can do that through books, podcasts, audio books, uh, coaches, mentors, whatever the case may be. 
But the more you knowledge you gain, the better off you're going to be. And it also helps take you from being an average or good investor to being actually a great investor. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that they can create amazing passive income streams for themselves and their family and their future generations if they just learn the right things and then apply that knowledge. It's not just enough to have the knowledge, but you got to put the energy and action behind it. So execution is everything, but execution also won't get you where you want to go unless you have the right knowledge. And it's kind of like the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. You know, uh, Alice asked, Cheshire Cat asked Alice, you know, um, where are you going? She said, well, I'm not exactly sure. Well, then she said, you know, he says, well, and then any path will get you there. Yeah. Because if you don't know where you're going, you know, it doesn't matter what road you take. So educate yourself. And that's critically important. That's why it's number one. It's there for a reason because it all starts with knowledge. Yeah. I love so, it. I, I agree a hundred percent on that. That's, that's one of those things. I think a lot of people try to delegate this, right? Even, even in non-real estate, just like they say, I have a financial advisor and I've given my, and I'm like, there's certain things in life you have to master. The things that you do every day that affect you more than anything else. Investing is one of them. Your body, health, fitness, that's one of them. Like you can't delegate this stuff, but so many people do. And, uh, and, and that's, it's, it's, it's a formula for disaster, I think. Cause how do you know if your financial advisor is doing a good job? It's not that you, I mean, you can eventually delegate it if you have the knowledge, right? But, but you can't do that if you, if you don't know how to evaluate someone's, what they're doing. Yeah, that's true with most things. I mean, if you're if you if you need an asset protection plan, you're going to talk to an asset protection attorney. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a long list of them. The thing is, that you can't have an intelligent conversation and know what questions to ask or understand what they're saying to you unless you have kind of a fundamental base level uh, knowledge. So you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to go to university for four years to have the same degree that these professionals have. Right. But you need to be in the same ballpark and play on the same field with them in order to be able to have an intelligent conversation. Yep. Uh, so number two is to set investment goals. And this is critically important because a lot of people wish to be rich and have all kinds of different dreams and wishes, but a goal is different. You see, you can wish to be rich, but that doesn't mean you'll ever become rich or take the steps to make that wish come true. Right. So when you set clear and specific investment goals, you're ultimately creating a roadmap and then an action plan to become financially independent or achieve whatever that goal may be. And it's been proven time and time again that people are statistically far more likely to achieve financial freedom or financial independence when they actually write down their goals and they're very detailed about the, their goals um, versus not doing anything at all. And the best type of goal is a SMART goal, which is an acronym for being sm uh, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and have a timestamp on it. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, you create un unconsciously or consciously, maybe it's a force of the universe, but you set in motion something within you and around you that puts you on the right path to get to that point. And as long as you've got action steps tied to those goals, you can't help but to be successful because the only way to fail is to actually stop. If you quit, that's how you fail. If you don't quit, you're going to stay going down that path to achieve that specific goal that you've set out for yourself. And so just do it. That's the bottom line. You know, you hear this time and time again from Tony Robbins to Brendan Burchard and everybody else. But at the end of the day, it's not enough to hear it. you got to do it. Right. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. That one, you know, I had uh, I, I when I started out doing real estate investment, my goal was to have five thousand dollars a month of passive income from real estate because then I figured I could retire. I could quit my job. Like if I have that income, I might not be a king living like a king, but I could. I didn't have to work for anyone else, you know, any in my life. And what was good about having that actual goal number was that every time I bought a property, I could t I could tell how many properties was do I need to buy, you know, as I'm paying off the mortgages, what is my return and where how am I moving closer to that? And I charted it over time. Every year, every month, I knew what my net worth was. I knew, you know, how close I was, what was my passive income, took the averages for every single month, and I could see the progress and I was like, okay, all I have to do is this. And I, and I knew I would get there as opposed to just hoping someday I'll be rich or retired. Brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you did that, John. I mean, the, your goals can include the number of properties you need to acquire each year, mm -hmm. the annual cash flow they generate, the type of property, the location of those properties. It could be anything and everything, but, you know, be clear, specific. And yep. so good job. Glad to hear you did that. So number three is never speculate. And, you know, this mm -hmm. is just... The point here is always have a long-term perspective in mind. You know, people made the mistake in 2004, 5, and 2006 of 
of buying properties and thinking they were investing, but they weren't. And I say investing in quotes. Right. Uh, you know what they were doing is speculating on 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 appreciation, speculating on you know capital growth, and and that's really more of a hope. You know, you don't know if that's going to happen down the road, and it's also hard to know if a market actually peaks. It's usually six to nine months after the fact that you can actually verify whether a market has topped off or peaked. So if you're trying to time the market, you're really just trying to chase after potential appreciation gains. And that's not a prudent way to invest. Prudently investing is investing with cash flow in mind and a long-term perspective. And that's a segue to number four, and that's invest for cash flow, because cash flow is king. And with very few rare exceptions, you always want to buy properties with positive cash flow, the higher the better, and that's a cash on cash return. That's immediate returns. That's a yield and, and spendable cash that you get today and that you could use to in, spend or reinvest as you go. You see, John, I like to call cash flow the glue that holds your real estate deal together. Because if you've got cash flow coming in and it pays for all your expenses and your debt service and you factored in for all the soft costs that will come up down the road, such as vacancies and maintenance and repairs, what you have left over is your net cash flow from the property. That's real spendable cash. It's investable cash. And if you do that times two properties, five properties, 10 properties, 20 properties, guess what? You're, you're, you're at a point where you become financially independent. And as time goes on, there are strategies to snowball and multiply those effects and leverage the, the equity you have in those properties to really magnify your returns. And now you become financially free, not just financially independent. So cash flow is the cornerstone. It is king. And you should always focus on positive cash flow in markets that prop, that offer that appreciation or growth potential. Now you have the best of both worlds. So that is so important. Invest for cash flow. Don't speculate because, hey, it works sometimes. But you know what? It w didn't work for a million plus people back in 2006, 07. Yeah, I agree. I agree 100 percent with that. That's this one of the things I preach. In fact, you know, I was there investing in in that at that time. And and when when the when the market crashed when when we had that that huge real estate bubble and i i was i got slammed by it but it didn't hurt me at all it, like i i watched as other people I, I remember at the time i would get loans on my properties and the the mortgage brokers would say you're crazy why are you getting 30-year fixed loans like what we have a pay option arm like you think you're smarter than all the rest of the investors here i got a guy that just rolled up in a rolls royce you think you're smarter than that guy and I said, you know what? Maybe I'm not, but you know, it's an I was thinking investment. So I said, okay, 30 year fixed loan is gonna be, it's always gonna be a good deal. Like it's it's positive cash flow now, it'll be positive cash flow in 30 years, right? Nothing's gonna change. The only thing that's gonna go up is the rent's gonna go up. And man, when that market crashed, some of my equity got cut in half. I had a fourplex I bought for four hundred and twenty-five thousand, and it got you know appraised at like around two hundred and twenty-five thousand the next year. But guess what? I had a thirty-year fixed mortgage on it. My payment didn't change. Uh, in fact, the rents went up because people couldn't buy houses, and I survived it. And I, I ended up it actually benefited me because then I was able to refinance all my my loans to lower interest rates and still thirty-year fix. And uh, and I was watching people just dropping like flies. All, all everyone that was doing speculation, uh, that that was it for them. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a smart move. Brilliant. I I love the thirty year fixed rate product. You know, because you know exactly what your monthly mortgage payment is. Mm -hmm. And what what a lot of people don't realize, uh, and this is you know good for for your audience to know, is your your payments are actually going down every year mm -hmm. in in real dollar terms. And people don't realize that because inflation. Yeah. You're, yeah, your lenders don't adjust for, for inflation every year. They don't increase your, your mortgage payment to accommodate or adjust or compensate for the rate of inflation, the real rate of inflation, or for any rate of inflation for that matter. So what's happening is every year you're paying off that mortgage or that mortgage payment. You're making the mortgage payment in cheaper and cheaper dollars because you're paying it off in inflated dollars. So that $500 monthly mortgage payment on your $100,000 property today is still going to be $500 a month 10 years from now. But in real terms, you're actually paying it off with about $420, not mm -hmm. 500. Yet your rents are going up and the property value is going up to compensate for that rate of inflation. That's why real estate is, is probably the best hedge against inflation that there is. Yeah, absolutely. And 100% agree. On multiple levels. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's just smart. And the fact that you could borrow 80% of that, which, you know, is my 10th rule, um, you know, the, the, you could borrow 80% of the purchase price and get 100% of the benefits. 
why wouldn't you invest in real estate? I mean, the question is not what should you invest in real estate, but how many properties can you get? How many do you want? Right? Exactly. Exactly. And it might be, I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll discuss this at the end. If you've got some rules that are going to kind of cover this, but one of the things that would be good to hear from you too, is just, you know, I get a lot of argument from people about the best investments. They say, well, I get, I get seven and a half percent in the S and P 500 index funds. And, you know, and my arguments are, well, you're going to pay capital gains tax on that. And it's not guaranteed. And they're like, well, why would I accept the cap rate in real estate of like 6% or 7%? Uh, Cause you know, but but it, it, overall, that's just that's just your you know your your cap rate. Your actual IRR ends up being a lot more than that, and and it's a leveraged it's a leveraged uh, you know return as opposed to you know the the stock markets. But I, I guess so. So when people you know sometimes when people hear about cash flow investing in real estate, right? They think, oh, well, you can't make money doing cash flow investing. Uh, you know. So what what do you say to that? Uh, you know, because that, that, that's why they move in, the, I think, in the direction of speculation. They're like, oh, well, you have to speculate to make money. Uh, but, but you know, cash flow, you know, Midwest type of properties, stuff like that. People look at them and they're saying, ah, it's, it's only like, you know, 5 6% cap rate, 7% cap rate, doesn't matter. Well, there's five ways to make money with real estate. Hmm. What, what these people you're talking to are just looking at one aspect of it, and that's the income. When you're measuring cap rate, you're just measuring income as if you bought the property all cash. But the, the, the second factor is what we just talked about, the fact that you could leverage your investment capital five to one. So now you're magnifying that rate of return. It's easily in the teens when you look at cash on cash return, but it's actually a lot higher than that because you've got three other factors to, to, to fold into the uh, return. You've got amortization of the loan every month as you get that mortgage payment or that rent payment from your, your, your investor, you're amortizing the loan. So your equity increases a little bit each and every month. So you're right. gaining a rate of return on that increased equity that you have. So that you've got to measure that. Uh, then you got to look at the um, appreciation over time. So you, 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 you know, whatever that is, 2%, 6%, 8%, whatever, over time, it averages out probably in the range of four to 7% over time, average time, per year. Times five, right? Because you're, exactly. you're leveraged there. Times five, because you're leveraged there. If you're, if you're, leverage to a one to five ratio yeah if you're measuring it is your if you're measuring it against your investment capital yes that's that's true um so you've got amortization of loan appreciation on the property you've got the income and then you know last but not least you got depreciation so yeah. every year the irs allows you to write off 127.5 in other words 127 and a half if you know <laughs> i yeah. say that um, but you know, this is a phantom deduction, meaning that you literally don't have to spend a single penny to get that depreciation. You could use that to write off against all your other passive income. Yep. Um, and some, in some cases, even your active income, um, each and every year. So that minimizes it or potentially even reduces or eliminates the tax impact. So now you have a much larger rate of return. And so when you when you look at those five things, you realize that that there are many factors involved in your rate of return. So often a piece of real estate will give you a 30 some percent, sometimes a 40 something percent overall rate of return. Yes. It's not just the cap rate. That's very one dimensional and very myopic in terms of how real estate performs as an investment. I'm, gl I'm glad to hear you saying that because every time I start telling people that I'm getting 25, 30% or more returns on real estate, they think I'm smoking crack. They think that I'm crazy. They think that I'm inflating numbers and making shit up when I, when I'm, you know, when it's exactly what you said, it's those five ways that you're making money. It's not just the cash flow that I'm getting. A lot of that money is that, that leverage appreciation over time, which is a very conservative estimate. And then that depreciation really can, it can be significant. I know, I know even like a lot of, a lot of people actually have such high depreciations uh, with, with leveraged properties that they actually offset their entire income and they pay no taxes uh, on, on the regular yeah. income. So, yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine, Robert Kiyosaki, maybe you've heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I've talked to him about this multiple times. He, he literally pays zero, zero tax on, yeah. on his real estate portfolio because he's got, he makes, He's got so much in terms of depreciation off, off of all of his assets. And, and he also has some oil and gas investments. That when you look at all the depreciation he has, he literally writes off all the, he doesn't write off, he eliminates the tax impact on all his passive income. 
because of that depreciation. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing unfair about it. It's uh, that is in the tax code and that's available to everybody. You just play the same game, follow the same rules. You get the same benefits. It's that simple. Exactly. And I think a lot of people don't understand it because they don't understand that it's a, it's a deferred tax, right? Because when you do the, when you depreciate it, you change your basis point. And so if you sell the property, of course, you're going to have, you're going to be taxed on whatever that gain is going to be larger. But that's why, like we talked about at the beginning of this, of this conversation, I did 1031 exchange and took all those six properties and I'm going to perpetually defer the tax and never pay that tax on it because I can, and I can pass it down to my heirs and, and they will get a, uh, what is it called? Uh, it'll be reset essentially. They it's a step up basis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You just said what I was about to say, and that is you could literally defer your your tax your taxes indefinitely if you if you know what you're doing and you know we we this is more of an advanced strategy beyond the scope of this call today mm. um, but we do this with our clients all the time you know it's it's more of an advanced strategy but you could literally defer and eliminate your taxes in per in perpetuity yeah and so imagine that never having having all the benefits and having that income and never having to pay tax on it if you do it right and you follow the IRS rules they're there uh, you 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 never have to pay tax on it. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Whereas all the other investments that you might do, you know, you're going to, you're going to pay those capital gain taxes at some point and you can't compound it without yeah. paying the taxes either. That's, that's, that's the big issue with a lot of the investments, especially if you move money around, right? Is it's, uh, unless you're going to stick to the one investment and not sell it, which even like S and P 500 index funds, uh, oftentimes you're still going to get hit with those taxes because one of those companies is going to come off of the fund, the it changes, you know, they end up selling or, or rearranging the, the shares to to uh, balance the portfolio and then pretty soon you're going to get you know you're going to get a tax bill on that so right exactly so very good um yeah th there was all kinds of good stuff that we just talked about in the last five minutes that could spin off onto tangents and become like yeah. topics of their own <laughs> i know <laughs> so not to get too far off the rails okay yeah and... let's let's stay on track here what's the next what's the yeah, next one you got here back to any of that but okay. uh, just to, you know keep moving on on the 10 rules here uh, but by the way, just a quick comment. Um, you made me think about this about four minutes ago. Mm. The whole thing about you know the the overall rate of return and people not believing those numbers. You know when you talk to clients or friends or family, whatever. Look, it's so simple to prove this to you for yourself. Just grab a notepad, a pen, and a calculator, uh, or a spreadsheet on your laptop, and just lay the numbers out. You know, lo logically and objectively. Don't don't judge. Yeah. But you if you do the calculations it's simple math it's multiplication and division and addition yeah. you can show yourself uh we actually have a great tool on our website every single property has an orange button next to it, it says analyze this and it literally takes the numbers on that property and gives you a very detailed uh cash flow analysis with with the income expenses and at the bottom it shows you all the financial performance indicators uh, from cap rate all the way down to irr so you can see everything there and it, it doesn't show you the actual calculations, but it, it's got a logical flow from income through expenses to your cash flow. Um, and then it factors in, uh, you know, what your initial down payment was like 20,000. You can do this on a calculator right in front of you as you're looking at it, but you can see all your returns and you can see how they stack. You can go from a 7% cap to a 12% cash on cash to a total, like a 30 or 40% total return on investment when you factor in everything and you can see your amortization you can see your appreciation so when you add all those things up guess what hey i just made like 20 grand on this property this year or 30,000 on this property this year you know if my well let's call it 20,000 if i invested 60 what is that that's a 33% rate of return you know overall on my initial investment and that's not unrealistic that's actually a common example yeah Exactly. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree 100%. In fact, the first I think the first time I actually really realized this was there's a really good book called The Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller. And yeah. I, I like that book. I always I still recommend that book to everyone because it's got the charts in there. Right. And it was like all the other books I was reading on real estate. They were like saying, oh, yeah, you can do this. But then when you look at that 30 year chart and you're like, oh, wow. So this is exactly how this will play out. And this is like it's not a guess on how you're making the money then I think that's extremely valuable. And then like you said, with the goal setting, if you can look at that charter, you can use that the calculator on your on your site to actually see how it's gonna play out. You can actually see how you can achieve the goal. It's not just some kind of guess now, because you can see oh, year after year, this is what, what should happen. Yeah, it's all there. 
it's yeah. all there. It's just it's simple math. So as long as you went, you know, to second grade public school, you should be okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, the okay. fifth rule: being, being market agnostic. Mm -hmm. See, you know, the the I, I say this, you know, often the United States is a big country, okay, right. and we're made up of over 400 metropolitan statistical areas, and if you include the micro markets, there's well over 600 local real estate markets. But that's the thing: the country's made up of all kinds of local real estate markets. We don't have a national housing market. There's no such thing as one national housing market. There's no such right. thing. Point to it. You can't. You'll never show it to me. So what you need to realize is that every market moves up and down independently of one another because of all kinds of local factors. So what's happening in San Diego, California, where you live, is different than what's happening in Jacksonville, Florida, which is different than what's happening in Detroit, Michigan, which is different than what's happening in Indianapolis, Indiana. So knowing that and recognizing that, there are times when it makes sense to invest in a particular market and times when it doesn't. You as an investor should only invest in markets when it makes sense to do so. And not because you live there or right. you bought property there before, but because it makes fundamental sense to be in that market from an economic perspective, a fundamental perspective, housing market, health perspective, all the, these kinds of things. So even though there's an element of timing, I'm not suggesting that you try to time the market. You don't want to buck trends, but when you analyze markets, which is what you know we do every day, and we help you know educate investors on that fact and help them in choosing markets, you realize that yeah, the best markets are these markets over here, not necessarily the markets I live in. And this is a psychological hurdle that a lot of people have. You know, they they live in a bubble in in in, in Orange County, California, in San Diego, California, where you and I live. I like to say that we live in a bubble in a bubble. Like I mean, we're just so sheltered from the rest of the country. Yeah. that we don't really see what the reality is. You know, the million dollar house here is not typical, it's atypical. The median home of a house in the US is probably a $225,000 and most of what we sell is between 100 and 150,000. So, because they're in B class neighborhoods, B, B pluses, right? So when you get over that mental hurdle of having to invest in a two hour radius of where you live because the so-called quote unquote gurus say to invest within a one or two hour radius of where you live, when you get away from that, then you realize, man, there's a huge, there's a lot of opportunity out there, and my money can go a lot further in those markets versus the ones that I've been considering or not or thinking about or you know what's in my backyard. Does that make sense? Yep, hundred percent, hundred percent agree. In fact, that was one of those things where, like, I lived in Boise, Idaho when I first started investing, and I invested in that market, and it was a great market, and you know the the cash flow was great at the time, but as the prices started to go up and the cap rates started to go down, it was harder and harder to find deals. Then I had a friend that actually lived in Kansas city, Missouri, and he wanted to get started in real estate investment. And I called up some agents there and they were telling me about the deals. I was using the 1% rule at the time. And they were yeah. telling me that they had deals that were like 1.1%, 1.2%. And in Boise, I was looking for 0.9s. Like 0.9 was like cream of the crop. And I said, well, if you got a 1.1% deal from me, I, I'll like, let's buy it. I'll buy it tomorrow. Like, I, here's my money. Take my money. And I got a 1.2% deal there. And, uh, and, and so I started investing in Kansas City. I ended up buying a lot of property there. And I bought uh, all the property I bought in Kansas City. I bought it all sight unseen. I had never seen the properties. Uh, you know, I just got management in place. And it was, it was a great decision. But but what it what it taught me was that you know I could look at different markets and look at where the investment opportunity is where where's the highest cap rate where's the highest cash flow that I'm going to get and then you know if it's a very high cash flow place like Boise was eventually the cap rate is going to drop down and the prices are going to go up because people will start investing their money there like it's going to you know those those cycles are going to come so rather than trying to time the market I'm just looking where's the cash flow and that's that's kind of been my strategy since then yeah, that, yeah, that, that that's a great story and a great example. And and it, coincidentally and interestingly enough, that's exactly what I was doing. I was personally investing in Kansas City, Missouri, up until about two years ago because the numbers got squeezed. The inventory yeah. was dropped. Prices were appreciating too fast. That rent to value ratio that you're talking about dropped below one percent. It was harder to find acceptable deals. Mm -hmm. So I stopped buying in Kansas City and I moved on to the next market. But that's exactly what I'm talking about. That is the whole thing about being market agnostic. Don't ever attach yourself to one and one and only one market. You need to understand that if you're investing in real estate, you need to be open to the idea that mar other some markets do better than others. And that's the fact.
Now, right? the one the one thing I, I I'm curious about your opinion on this that uh, that I struggled with, which is uh, like the I think the biggest headache, maybe just in general, this is could go into a whole thing, but property management. So like that's the one wrench and that's I found in my real estate investing is that I, I found this. This is the pattern that I found, right? And and especially managing from multiple, you know, all over the country if you have different property managers. But I found that the way property management works is you find a really good property management company, they're small, they take care of you, they care about the the investor and about the properties. As they grow a little bit bigger, they have to they get in-house maintenance. And when they get in-house maintenance, and uh, they start to realize that they're making more money from the in-house maintenance than they are actually managing the property, only taking a few percent. So then they start actually turning that into their their profit center. And then once that happens and they become a big property management company, you're screwed because they're basically, you know, overcharging you for maintenance, doing unnecessary maintenance, all this, this kind of thing. And I, I went through this pattern multiple times and had to fire property management companies. But that was my biggest hesitation was spreading out all over the countries. It's like so hard to find a, a good property management company. And I know they're going to go through this cycle and I'm going to have to get rid of them eventually. I mean, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but what's your whole take on that, that whole dilemma? Yeah, so that's not a function of the market. You still need to be market agnostic. That's really a function of your agreement with the management company and how you're managing your manager. So what I mean by that is every management agreement will have a threshold dollar amount where they will have to call you for an approval on something over, let's say, 250 bucks, 300, 400, 500 dollars. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then you look at their estimate. They they provide it's not an emergency, but you know if there's a repair that needs to be done, have them give you an estimate or a quote on what it what it is that needs to be repaired. What you can do is you and you can be right up front with your management company. Just say, look, I review and approve all repairs over three hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollars. And if they know that they're on notice, then you mm -hmm. can flat out be up front and tell them, look, I set, tell them I say just say I might get one or two other bids or quotes on this repair because I'm shopping it and that's a smart thing to do as a prudent landlord you, you know you want the best you want the best work at the best price and so if you're going to get two or three quotes you're going to pick the one you feel the most comfortable with and possibly that is giving you the best deal or the best price on that repair so they know that they can't try to you know pull a fast one on you by inflating uh, the repairs so if you're sending someone else out there uh, even if it's just someone who does a a, a, a essentially a drive-by inspection you know they're not an inspector but just to verify or validate that there is a problem uh just so you know and the the property management company knows that you, they're not going to be able to fool you or trick you into a a, a repair that doesn't really exist then um uh you know then you won't have that problem so just maintain control that's really the bottom line and that's and that's actually my 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 uh you know ninth rule is maintaining control Okay. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense that, you know, it, just having it spread out, I was concerned with dealing with multiple property management companies and, and I've had to do that. I just, it, it's a bit of a hassle, I suppose, but I guess that's part of the, you know, I had one instance where just recently I had a roof that needed to be replaced and they were, you know, the property management company got three bids and the bids came in like 10,000, 9,000, 8,000. And I went and got three bits of my own and it came in 4,000, 5,000, you know, uh, somewhere at 5,500. Right. And I was like, and okay, yeah. Yeah. You, you, what you're doing is you're, um, you're cross checking, you're validating, you know, yeah. you're, 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 you're verifying what they're giving you as being, you know, in line and correct. So, and, and you know what, if they were trying to, pull a fast one on you, they know now that they can't do that going forward because you're going to, you're going to verify numbers. You're going to shop around for any big ticket item. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And it, and it makes sense. That's what I kind of came to the conclusion was I was like, you know what, uh, you know, they might nickel and dime me on small stuff. That's like under a hundred dollars or $200. It's not worth my time. Right. Like no. I, I guess if I was, I was just starting out, I was just had one property. It'd be worth my time. But with the number of doors I have, it's not worth my time. So I was like, okay, if it's over like 500 bucks, then I'll I'll scrutinize it and and that's what I ended up doing because you know saving a couple of thousand dollars by doing you know ten minutes of work is worth it but uh, maybe saving ten dollars for like you know uh, you know twenty minutes worth of conversation is not worth it right yeah so that's why you set that minimum threshold yeah okay so, uh, let's see what's uh, so we're on what numbers is it six, six. Or seven okay yeah what's up so 
<clears throat> so what you want to do is take a top-down approach, which means that you don't want to do what a lot of investors do. You know, they they look at a property and they're analyzing the property and they, you know, they look at the photos, it's newly renovated, it looks good, it, it's got good but good appeal, good curb appeal, they fall in love with it, the numbers make sense on paper, maybe they're actual numbers and they fall in love with it. But you know, you, you have to realize that you can't uproot that property. It's married and, mm -hmm. and joined to the neighborhood, and that's attached to the market. So taking a top-down approach means that you're really starting by analyzing the market first. Mm -hmm. And 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 not just the property. So you you got you can't separate property from location. And this is a big mistake. And if you don't consider the investment in light of that market and the neighborhood that it's in, you're making potentially a big mistake. Mm -hmm. So the best approach is to first choose the market or the city that you want to invest in based on the health of that housing market and the local economy. And what I mean by that is what's going on there in terms of unemployment, job growth, population growth, uh, the business climate, uh, is it landlord friendly? Do you see people moving in uh, re more so than moving out? Um, that kind of stuff. You know, what's the story? <clears throat> and then from there, you narrow things down to the best areas and neighborhoods. And you base that on amenities and schools and crime and uh, walkability and renter demand uh, desirability. Once you've identified the market in the neighborhoods, now you start looking at properties. That's the time when you start looking and ferreting out the best deals within those neighborhoods because now you've licked 80% of, of what you need to do to minimize your risk and maximize your, your upside potential. Okay, okay. Now, a uh, question about that. This is one I've always wondered is how do you figure this out? I mean, like I stumbled into it with Kansas City, Missouri, right? Just because I happened to talk to the real estate agent and found out that was good cash flow at that time. But someone starting out, they want to figure out what is a good market. What do they like? What? How do they find this information? A lot of this stuff, if not most of it, uh, or all of it, is free online. You know, if you just pull out a search engine like Google and you start typing in the name of that city or market, followed by the words unemployment, unemployment trends, job growth, job growth trends, population growth, um, uh, housing, like. How, you know, city name, housing market, you'll start to get a plethora of information. You can start, you know, gathering tons of data and information about what's going on there and, and the information about that market. Uh, often it has to do with, you know, uh, uh, price growth, price trends, uh, uh, population growth, job growth, you know, things that center around those topics. You'll find tons of information. That's how you do some research on the markets. Then you can apply the same methodology on the neighborhoods. You can, you know, uh, talk about, pull up addresses or actual neighborhood names or sub markets, what they call um, um, uh, suburbs of, of ma major cities and start doing that same kind of uh, demographic and, and analytical uh, analysis on, on those markets. Ultimately, uh, when you get down to the neighborhood level and you're looking at properties specific, um, when you have addresses, you can pop that into uh, various paid services like Neighborhood Scout is one example of a website that is, you know, a subscription based model, but it gives you a ton of information and data about that location and that neighborhood. So it's just one of the tools out there. Trulia.com, Zillow.com will give you a bunch of information, like free information. They give you heat maps and crime information and school information and walkability scores and that kind of stuff. So a lot of it is available out there, most of it for free, but that's how you do it. Okay. And like discovering, like coming up with a list of like, I mean, you can pull the data, but how do you know where to even even look like you know some of the the things that i've done is i'm I just like i hear something i'm like okay there's a lot of people that are seem to be investing in texas right now let me check some of the cities in texas right uh you know maybe arkansas right i've seen a lot of deals that are popping up but but i don't really have a systematic way are you just kind of looking at cities like how do you when you're sourcing stuff where how are you figuring out what markets that you want to look at to actually pull up the data to see if they're good well it's everything we just talked about but I also looked for a couple other things. I, I want to see the health of the housing market. Is there inventory, available mm -hmm. inventory that makes uh, good investment quality or investment grade rentals? Mm -hmm. um, is there a good balance between supply and demand? Is, uh, can I assemble the right team of people in that market that we can work with so that way we can uh, connect our clients to them and have them invest successfully? Um, 
those are really kind of the key things above and beyond what we just talked about. Um, but, you know, the numbers need to make sense in that market. Like San Francisco might be a strong growing market, as an example, with good, good employment, but the numbers don't make sense. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, why would you invest in a million dollar property that you can't rent for more than about 4000 a month? Right. right. Yeah. It's going to be automatically a speculation move there. You can't. Yeah. So, so even markets have a rent to value or rent to price ratio. You know, you, they, that gives you just kind of a very, gen, very, very general litmus test on the market itself. Uh, but within that market, you're going to see higher and lower RV ratios in different suburbs and areas within that market. Okay. So, so it's just a matter of kind of just kind of having a list of cities you want to check out and just going through and doing the homework on each one of those to see, see what, what's out. What, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, you, if you go to, I mean, we track over 400. I, I you know, I have um, more um, um, detailed, uh, robust analytical tools that we use internally here that, that show us market momentum and, and we apply what's called technical analysis to markets. Right, okay. To, to do an analysis, we can really see what's going on and where the trends are. Uh, but not having access to those tools, you can just go to our website in fact, we're going to start publishing top markets here in the very near future, oh, nice. worst markets and best markets. But for now, you can see the 22 markets we're in right on our website, and you can see why we're in those markets because of what we just talked about. Yep. Okay. No, that's a starting point. Yep. Makes sense. All right. What else we got here? So number seven is, is as an investor, you start to build a portfolio. You, you might be buying properties in a particular market, but at some point you want to diversify. And, you know, we, we talk about diversification or at least you hear about it in terms of spreading your eggs into different baskets. So you're not all into, you know, uh, growth stocks or mutual funds or this or that. Well, you can apply the same concept in real estate. And what that means is that you focus on one market at a time and you accumulate hypothetically between three and five income properties in that one market first. And then once you've done that, then you diversify geographically into another market, a prudent market that makes sense mm -hmm. from that first one. And that typically means that you're in another state, but you now you rinse and repeat, you accumulate three to five, maybe more, but three to five properties in that second market. So now you've got a good footprint in two markets and then you do that again in a third. You don't really need to do that in more than five markets. So if you buy three to five properties and you do that in three to five markets, you have a pretty darn good portfolio yeah. and you're spread geographically into different economies, different local markets. And, um, uh, you know, that just kind of helps to minimize the quote unquote risk that you might see in one market if, if it's going through a decline in, in its own real estate cycle. Uh, because, you know, market cycle, you know, unemployment goes up and down, you know, taxes go up and down, things change. But but ideally, this just helps to weather the storm as the years go by, as things change, you know, more globally, generally on terms of the U.S. housing market. There's no such thing. The U.S. Um, the U.S. economy and then uh, overall in those local markets. So um, it's a simple concept. I like to call it three to five in three to five. It's really just buy three to five properties in one market, move on to the next one and do that in three to five markets. And it really, for most people, that, that's a very good real estate portfolio. Yeah, that makes, I think that's also good to like what, what I've been doing, which we talked about a little bit was, you know, as that cap rate starts to drop in the market, because it's not even protecting me. I mean, yes, it's protecting the downside if the markets go down because I'm in multiple places. But what I like to 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 do is if that cap rate starts dropping, that means that the prices are going up, that there's no longer good deals in that market. Then I can move to a market that has a high cap rate. And now, like, because people always say, well, you know, if I sell my house or I sell my property, you know, it doesn't matter if the price has gone up because everything's more expensive. So I'm going to buy something bigger, but it's going to be more expensive as well. But that's not true when you switch markets and you go into a market that now has a higher cap rate or yeah, it has, has a higher cap rate. And then you can move that money. And now you get you get to re, you know, leverage that money. And that's you know that's exactly what, you know, what I've been doing is I've been moving properties around is had a lot of money in Boise, Idaho. And then as those property values went up, those cap rates started going down, started moving some of that money to Kansas City. And now it's happening again where Kansas City, the cap rate is is going down right. and, and compressing. And so now I'm looking for now I'm looking more east, even, you know, looking at uh, some of the some of the south and Tennessee, Arkansas, you know, places like that 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 
where, where it's you're still able to get that high cap rate. So I, I, I love that concept. It, it keeps you from from being trapped in that that place where if all the prices yeah. go up and you sell your property, you got to and you buy something new, you know, then it's it's also expensive. So. Right, right. Yeah, you're being smart with your equity, uh, yeah. but that diversification never goes away. You, you, you might right. change markets, but you're you're always going to have that portfolio and you're going to leverage it up and in, into better markets. Yeah. So the eighth rule is is pretty simple and straightforward. If you think about it, it's just use professional property management. You know, you never mm -hmm. want to manage your own properties. Yes. You know, property management is a thankless job. Nobody likes it. It yeah. requires a solid understanding of tenant landlord laws and marketing skills and people skills and dealing with tenant complaints and excuses, even though there may not be very many of them. But your time is more valuable than that. At least for me, it is. And I think for most people, it would be. So spend it with your family. You know, focus on your career, building your business, whatever you do, and then look for more property. Um, if, if, if you're investing remotely, have professional full service management do that for you. Yeah. Uh, number nine, maintain control. We kind of touched upon this before, but be a direct investor in real estate. You know, you, you know, own it, control it, call the shots. If you're investing in funds or partnerships or paper-based assets or paper-based investments, you really have no control and no voting uh, ability. You don't even know who the management company is. It probably is laden with fees. And if you're leaving your financial future to corporations and fund managers, you're really getting the short end of the stick. So there are very few exceptions to this. There are some, but generally speaking, be a direct investor. Control, uh, control your entire portfolio. Own it, you know, within your entities and away you go. And then, last but not least, number ten is leverage your investment capital. This is huge. We talked about this as well before, but the fact that you can leverage your investment capital five to one and borrow other people's money and purchase and control 100% of your investment real estate and have 100% of the benefits. You'd be crazy not to take advantage of this and get as much of it as you possibly can, because at the end of the day, the leverage that is available to you in investment real estate allows you to magnify your overall rate of return and it just accelerates the wealth creation that you have available to you. So get as much of it as you can. It's it's an incredible benefit that's only available through investment real estate. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree. Yeah. Awesome. And the uh, one quick question on on nine there. What's your opinion on DSTs and the uh, as far as like rolling over and doing 1031s is one of the things I was considering and I ended up, you know, buying commercial property. But uh, but I was strongly considering the DST, which would be obviously something that I would have no control over once I invest into it. But uh, just curious to get your take on it. I, I actually did a very detailed podcast episode with a, a guest about, I don't know, at least a year ago about the the uh, Delaware Statutory Trust. It's a very interesting vehicle. It's it's not it's not ideal for someone who's just doing a 1031 on a on a very small portfolio or single property. The, the cost benefit is not there. Um, I, I, I don't I'm not an expert on the DST, so I really don't know how much value I can provide there. Um, I like the idea of it. I, I like that it offers more flexibility and it's and it doesn't have the time constraints that a 1031 does. Um, so there's certainly some advantages with it, definitely some pros compared to a 1031. Uh, the disadvantage would be the cost of it versus doing a 1031. Mm -hmm. But if you have a large portfolio or a lot of equity that you're moving, that might be kind of a moot point. Uh, beyond that, I, I, I don't know what more to tell you about a DST. It's something you should definitely do some research on and look into. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, fair enough. All right. Well, uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And, you know, it's great to, to, to connect with someone that's got very similar. I feel like we've got a very, very similar outtake on, on real estate investment. You know, I talked to a lot of people that, that uh, claim to be real estate investors and they're real estate speculators. And it's very frustrating <laughs> a lot of times, uh, especially when they're giving people bad information, but everything, every piece of advice that you have given today has, I agree the hundred percent solid, uh, you know, um, definitely, uh, definitely, you know, recommend that uh, that people check you out. So, uh, real quick before we wrap this up, uh, you know, if I guess the, the biggest selling point that that I, you know, that I have, because I've actually talked to a lot of people about about checking out uh, what you guys do. Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing in my mind is that you're doing all the homework for everyone and and you're, you're you know obviously you still have to have rule number one have the knowledge but uh, you know 
when you look at the deals, you know, what, why would someone uh, come and, and buy properties from you? What's kind of the, the value that they're getting when they, when they go to your company to buy? Well, that's a good question. So we, we provide that investment opportunity. We call it a turnkey real estate investment. We have anywhere from one to 200 properties available at any given times across the U.S. spread across 22 markets. So we've already done the market selection and the market research. We've already done the research on the neighborhoods. We've already vetted the properties and the providers that we get the properties from. We have the management in place. The tenants are in place. It's cash flow. You're cash flow positive from day one. We have the team of people you need from lenders to the title companies, the inspectors, asset protection, attorneys, um, uh, CPAs and bookkeepers if you need that. Uh, The education piece was something that didn't happen right away, but we started doing that, you know, almost 14, 15 years ago. And now it's, you know, it's reports, guides, the the, the weekly free podcast. Um, we hold your hand and we're very consultative. We're agnostic across the board. So we're unbiased and we can help you build that portfolio. And we do everything I just talked about at no cost to you. It's a free service. So you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Uh, you gain education, you gain experience, and you gain a portfolio that that'll create your financial independence and financial freedom. So there's everything to gain and nothing to lose. It's really a kind of crazy not to actually be working with us and I, I i don't mean to boast but at the end end of the day there's no reason why anyone shouldn't unless you want to do it all on your own that's fine too you know we'll help you go in that direction because we educate you on how to do it but mm. you can choose to do it with us it's a done for you service essentially i mean you still need to be engaged and involved in the purchase process but once you've closed escrow and it's in your portfolio we'll follow up with you but it's, it's essentially just rinse and repeat rinse and repeat yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, for someone who is is starting out and they're busy, maybe they're building their business or they're doing something else, they don't have a lot of time to devote to, you know, like we talked about, finding the markets, finding the deals in the market, going and doing all this stuff, negotiating the deal. There's a lot involved in acquiring real estate that I think a lot of people don't realize when they start out. For them to be able to just go and have a turnkey, here, here's a good deal. It's already vetted for you. This is the cap rate. This is the actual return. Management is in place. To me, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, to do that. I wish that when I was starting out that, you know, I had found you guys and, and was able to buy properties there because I've, I've spent, you know, two, three, it could take two, three months to find a deal and to chase down that deal and get everything uh, going and, and finally close on that that property. So, yeah, so that I think that makes makes perfect sense uh, what you said there. And uh, I was going to ask you one more question about that, which is, um, oh, uh, you know, everyone is always going to ask this. And, uh, you know, so I, I want to be completely transparent with my audience. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not making any money from this. Okay, just just so you guys know, we're not doing any kind of affiliate deal or anything. I just wanted to have Marco on to share uh, this his information with you, and because he's providing good service. Uh, but second, how are you making money from this? Now, I would assume that you're finding some properties that need a little bit of rehab. You're putting in some work, or you're buying undervalued properties, and then you're essentially wholesaling them as as turnkey. But uh, but. You tell me if I'm wrong or tell me what the, you know, I, I think it's important in any transaction for everyone involved to understand how the other party is making money. Yeah, no, it's a great question, a fair question. And, and I'm glad you asked. Actually, I had a suspicion that you might be asking that when you started yeah. going down that road. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's, it's a great question. The, the reality is, is, is we are a real estate brokerage. Mm-hmm. And so just like any other traditional real estate transaction, the real estate brokerage gets compensated on the sales side of the transaction mm-hmm. 99% of the time. So whether you call it, you know, a, a commission or a marketing fee or a sales fee or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, we refer to it as a, as, a, as a marketing fee internally, but we get compensated from the boots on the ground, the teams that we've assembled in each of these markets uh, when the transaction closes. The benefit to you as our client is this. Because you're not paying us a dime ever, it's for, everything we do is a free service, a value-added service to you, it allows us to remain agnostic. We are unbiased. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, we care and it matters, but it doesn't matter whether you're investing in, let's say, Birmingham, Alabama, or Indianapolis, Indiana, or anywhere else for that matter. We get compensated just the same. Right. So the fact that it doesn't change anything for us means that we're focused on you and your goals and what you're trying to achieve and what makes most sense for you in terms of markets, inventory, um, uh, in neighborhoods and all that other stuff. 
So we're unbiased. It's it has to be agnostic, and we are. And so that's our only revenue source is um, just essentially you know what what comes from the sale of the property. So commissions is is your base on right. being a brokerage collecting commission. So when you buy the when you when if someone goes on your site and they get a property from you, are you do you own the property or are you uh, creating the the contract, assigning the contract, or how's that working in, in that regard? Have you pre bought it and now you're selling it, uh, or you know what what's the the status there? Uh, so. Most of the properties, most of the time, and I mean 99% of the properties, 99% of the time, are owned by our affiliate partners in those markets, the teams that we've put together. So those new mm -hmm. home builders and those property providers that we work with, that we vetted, that we have a relationship with, that we've been working with for years, those are the people that are providing us the inventory. So think of a coin. There's two sides to it. The one side is the team that we've assembled on the ground. They acquire and build or acquire and renovate those those rental properties, those investment properties. Then they turn them over to us and that's the other side of the coin. And that's where we come in. We, we uh, educate and acquire clients uh, after that education process is going on and goes on forever actually. You know, we, we work with you, we help you identify the markets and the neighborhoods and the properties you should be investing in. And we handle the transaction, help you select the properties. We, we basically handle everything from when that property is rent ready and leased and cash flowing to when you close escrow and put it in your portfolio. So we're, we're kind of two sides of the same coin. There's the inventory of that product and then, then it's handed over to us and then we take it from there. Okay, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So the, the inventory piece of it, someone's making a, a cut, obviously it's either like a developer or someone who's, who's, uh, who's kind of wholesaling it to you. They found an undervalued property. However, they're going to, they're going to find that the deals in the market and then, and then they've got some profit baked in. But, um, but then the big question becomes this one obvious question, I guess, which is, so I'm a real estate investor, you know, I'm listening to this, this YouTube video or podcast. I'm excited. I want to start getting in, investing can I find better deals on my own? Like, what is the, what is the cost to me? Are you providing the same kind of deal? Am I paying, am I getting just like, you know, maybe you're giving me a deal that's like a 7.5% cap rate. If I went out on my own, I could find an 8% cap rate. What is the the cost that I'm, that I'm essentially paying in terms of, of the deal? Right. Because, you know, is it, you know, so if you buy a deal under market, obviously you're going to get a better, a better cap rate. How much, you know, how are you kind of pricing these and placing these things so that there's still enough right. profit in okay. for the investor? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good question. That, that question can be asked several different ways, yeah. depending on, you know, what angle you're looking at this from. Uh, it, it, here's, there's kind of a two part answer to that. Nobody, there's no markup or or premium being paid on these properties. The market value is the market value. Sometimes mm -hmm. the investor is purchasing it at market value. Sometimes they're purchasing it for less than market value. It just depends on how much inventory is in that market and how much investor demand or or retail demand there is in that market. Uh, when there's lots of inventory and low demand, you can always get a better deal than what true market value is. Sure. In 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 a in a seller's market like we are today in most markets around the country um it's quick these properties fly off the shelf it, they, they turn over quick so you don't need to discount them you can sell them at market value that doesn't mean you're not getting a good deal because remember you're doing an evaluation what is my cap rate what is my cash on cash return what what can i expect to get from this property you know what you're getting from this investment so you can determine whether it's a good deal or a bad deal based on that price so you you won't be paying over market value because you always get an appraisal. We and you know you, you don't have a choice if you're getting financing. So you'll right. always have an appraisal and an inspection done. So you know what you're getting. Um, but there's no add-on markups or premiums attached attached onto this. It is what it is. The price is the price. Sometimes it's negotiable. Usually it's not in a seller's market. But you know if there's a deal to be made, you know we can help shave a little bit off of that. We don't control the price. It's determined by the builder or the or the sellers that we work with, the people that do this as a profession. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but you know, the point is, is that th there's no add on or markup. It's, it, it is a good deal. Now, the other part is, I will say this real quick, that if you want a better deal, then you need to shift from being a passive real estate investor. And you were use the word time before that's hitting the nail right on the head where we provide tremendous value are for people who 
have limited time or don't have the time to invest to recreate the wheel, do go through the education, assemble the team, vet markets, vet neighborhoods, vet, you know, look for properties and do all that work. If you want to be an active real estate investor, great, go for it. You know, you can hopefully, if all everything goes well and everything goes like clockwork and you're not over budget and you do it within the time frame allotted to do that renovation, that acquisition and renovation, guess what? You might be able to build five, 10, maybe 15% equity in that property and get a better deal for yourself. And, and that means your, you know, your cost basis is lower and your rent to value ratio is going to be a little higher. But there's a lot of assumptions in what I just said. You know, that's assuming everything goes well and you're you're on budget or under budget, right? But that's being active. You've created a job for yourself. Now that's a business. But if you don't want to do all that, you want to be a passive real estate investor and continue doing what you love to do and what you, you know, spend time with your family, you can work with a company like ours and take the passive approach, build your real estate portfolio, create your financial independence and do that without any brain damage or hassle. <laughs> so yeah. that's what you got to weigh out. What, where do you want to be, passive or active? Yeah, no, it makes sense. I, I, I divide the two activities into two different things because people all the time tell me that they're they're flippers or that they they buy you know right. houses, renovate them, and rent them out. And it, with that one, in that case, I tell them, well, you're doing two jobs because one of them is you're buying a house and increasing the value, and you could figure out what your hourly rate was in that in that deal. Uh, and then the second thing you're doing is you're investing in the the property instead of selling it, you're just holding on to it. So now you're an yep. investor, but you're not an investor in both cases. You're not finding superior deals by doing that. It, it costs you time. And even if you didn't renovate the property, right? If you if you find something, you know, I could think of like let's say there's a property that's $120,000 is the market value. Well, yeah, you can hunt for a month and make a bunch of phone calls and knock on a bunch of doors and and get the, a similar property for $110,000 or maybe $100,000 but uh you know if it takes you 2 months worth of working on that and you've saved yourself ten thousand dollars. Well, you were <laughs> you actually you spent that time earning ten thousand bucks. So if you want to do that, that's otherwise, that's whereas in my case, I'll pay someone ten thousand dollars to bring me a deal. Like that's like you find me a good deal. Sure, I'll, I'll pay you money to find me a good deal. As if I don't want to spend the time because I can make more money in my business. Right, and that's that's my whole point. It all comes down to how much time do you have and what's your time worth. Because you're not an investor until you're done that renovation and and or that flip and you've got passive income, cash flow coming in. Now you're an investor. Up until that point, you're 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 creating a business, a job. You've created a project for yourself. Mm -hmm. There's no income coming from that. You stand potentially to lose money on that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, one uh, one last question here, and then I'll I'll let you go because this is one. Okay. Um, that uh, that I that a lot of a lot of people that I work with, you know, they uh, there's a lot of wholesalers out there, right? And a lot of the ways that the wholesalers work is that they have a deal, and usually these deals are, are are a little bit under market. They've got some profit baked in for them. But then the problem is when you buy from the wholesaler is you have to now have this hard money lender lined up because they don't have time for can for traditional financing they're doing an assign on the contract and you got to get the money cash you got to have a hard money lender where you're paying like nine ten percent interest rate or whatever the going rate is at the time and then later you can refinance that into a conventional loan whereas if my understanding is correct with with the way that you're doing things even though it seems like a similar thing it's not the same because you actually have real lenders not hard money lenders, but you you can actually get in escrow and, and close these properties in in thirty days and whatnot. Unless I'm misunderstanding. No, you're right. It's it's all the they're all pieces of 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 the building my real estate portfolio picture. A hard money lender doesn't apply in what we do. The reason mm -hmm. is is the hard money lender is only applicable when you're finding a property that you need to uh, close and acquire because it requires work it's it's distressed in some way and it requires work uh hard money is short-term money you only have yeah. it for six months maybe a year it's not permanent financing the 30-year right. fixed mortgage that you talked about is permanent financing that is the what you amortize over 30 years the hard money loan wants to be get in get out and get paid that's all they that's why they charge a premium they want short-term high return they're in yeah. and out and they're gone uh, whereas uh, a, a permanent financing is the lowest rate of return or the lowest interest rate. And it's there for that, you know, 30 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever it is. That's it. So you, you as an investor working with us will never get a hard money loan. It's permanent financing. You want that 30 year conventional cheap, cheap money to, to acquire your properties.
Okay. Yeah. That's good to hear. Cause I I've had a lot of, a lot of my coaching clients and whatnot where I've been helping them and they've had friends that do wholesaling and they're like, Oh, I got to get a, a hard money lender. And cause I got to pay all cash. And yeah. And if I'm you're like, a wholesaler, yeah. Yeah. Or a rehabber, you, you don't have a choice. You have yeah. to get hard money or private money. You can't exactly. get permit. Financing. They're not going to lend on it. Cause it's not, it's not lendable. It's, it's not an, a, an asset that's good enough to secure that long-term loan. Right. It doesn't appraise for the, for the value. No. Yep. No. Okay. Perfect. Well, well, thank you, Marco. This is awesome. You know, uh, and so if, if people want to check out uh, Narada real estate, where, where should they go? I'll definitely put a link uh, in the cards in the description below, but uh, what's the best, best place that they can go and, uh, you know, to, to find you and find more information about what you guys do. Yeah, all the information, articles, and freebies are available on two websites. The The property website is noradarealestate.com, the N-O-R-A-D-A, noradarealestate.com. And then the sister website is passiverealestateinvesting.com. That's the home of our podcast and also a bunch of free articles and information. And it's actually the easier one to remember, passiverealestateinvesting.com is actually not, you know, doesn't cause brain damage. But <laughs> I like So it. those are the two websites. Awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, thanks. Thanks again. John, thank you so much. I, it's been a lot of fun. Appreciate it.